Hello and welcome to Join His Prime with me, Anna Smin. We are coming to you live from our studios here at Kukumlim Lena Kram. And coming up in the next hour, Attorney General reiterates government's commitment to dealing with illegal mining as he assures his outfit will fast track the prosecution of Chinese Queen Aisha Wang and four others on trial for their involvement in illicit galamsey. We would have wanted that um, the trial would be dealt with speedily because a fair trial implies um, and speed as well. Stay for details as it emerges in courts that former national chairman of the new patriotic party, Freddie Blay, is lawyer for the four accomplices of Aisha Wang standing trial. We'll bring you details and get your reactions. Also, closure of shops in the vibrant business district of Edume in Kumasi begins to bite hard as hundreds of petty traders and consumers who rely on retailers say they're struggling to feed their families following a shortfall in their income. We went them to, to help us to reduce the, 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 the things because so that they can buy and we carry. Yesterday is not easy for us. This is happening at a time when the city continues to fall. We'll engage an economist on how the city continues to lose ground against the dollar. And over 73,000 girls aged between 12 and 17 years in Ghana are married or living with a man. We'll break down the figures released by the Ghana Statistical Service as the world marks International Day of the Girl Child. And coming up in Prime Business. Hello again, thanks for choosing us. To our first story now, the Attorney General, Godfrey Debo Adami, has said notice government will not relent in its efforts to weed out illegal mining and prosecute culprits. The AG spoke in court when Aisha Wang and four other accomplices were denied bail again by a high court judge who said her mind had not changed on the plea of lawyers for the accused persons. It was also at the hearing that it came up that former national chairman of the New Patriotic Party, Freddie Blay, is representing the four accomplices of Aisha One. Kwekwa Santi was in court and now reports. So it was an interesting day in court here at the High Court Complex here in Accra when Attorney General Godfrey Yebo Adame led government efforts to prosecute Aisha One and other foreign nationals who have all been arrested for engaging in illegal mining. Today, not only the Attorney General, Godfrey Yebo Adame, was in court. He was here with the Lands and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo, who offered some moral support to his colleague, Cabinet Minister, in dealing with this menace that some have said the government's fight is simply a farce. Well, they've denied it. They've denied it. I mean, if there's any substance to any such allegations, I think the best way to proceed is to conduct investigations. But, uh, well, those are not for me to decide. I mean, I think that uh, the matters are still out play and, and the minister has denied it flatly. I have full confidence in uh, the minister in my ministry and I, I don't think he will ever be involved in any, 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 any such conduct. And, and uh, early days yet, maintenance officials, for this excellent work they are doing, as you may be aware, one of the key pillars on which we are seeking to deal with this issue of illegal small scale mining is law enforcement and prosecution, particularly as it relates to foreigners. And as you can see, the Attorney General himself is, was in court and he himself is conducting this trial and um, prosecuting this case in a very spirited and enthusiastic manner. I think it's, uh, it helped my work. We will continue with our efforts on all fronts, on the law enforcement, the um, reforms, and as well as the prosecutorial uh, path which we, have, we are fully committed to. As you can tell, this Aisha one lady, uh, the government of President Akufuado is committed to bring her and other persons who are involved in illegal mining to face the full rigors of our laws in this country. We heard from the Attorney General who said this should send a signal to all those engaged in illegal mining that government is coming after them and that in the particular case of Aisha one, they were ready to take the trial day by day and ensure that this case is disposed of expeditiously. Um, we indicated our readiness, preparedness to commence the trial. And in respect of Aisha one, we had filed most of the documents to be relied on. We had filed witnesses, many of our four witnesses. We only needed to file about four more. And for that matter, we requested for a week. The judge, of course, in the exercise of her discretion, decided to adjourn to um, 24th or so for us to come and conduct the case management conference. And we are ready to proceed with the trial on the case on a day-by-day um, day basis. And the judge has also indicated inclination to 
conducted trial in that manner. So we are very happy with the progress of the matter. And I think it's very important that we um, indicate to the world our full commitment to um, prosecute all these illegal mining offenses. It's something that is of utmost importance to the nation. Yes, even though, of course, this lady found herself um, back into the country after her indefinite stay that had been granted in 2014 had been revoked in 2018. Yes, we'll prosecute her for both the past and, and, and current offences. I think the most important point for me as um, a prosecutor is that, yes, she's still kept in custody. Uh, of course, we would have wanted that um, the trial would be dealt with speedily because a fair trial in, in implies um, and speed as well. And for that matter, I would have appreciated for her plea to be taken today. But it is not a major setback. Um, we will we'll have her plea taken on the next agenda date. And the offence with which she's been charged will be dealt with as soon as possible. The Aisha one um, matter, we are ready to start trial, even if we are given the opportunity next week, as we indicated. The judge said we should come back to conduct what we call a case monitoring conference on 24th. And I believe after that, we should do it on a case by day basis. The other matter has been agenda to 1st November. I'm sure by that agenda it too, we'll be ready to proceed with the trial of that one as well. One other interesting issue that came up in court is now that the other foreign nationals who are standing trial with Aisha Wan are now being represented by former national chairman of the NPP, Freddie Blay. When asked, the attorney general said, well, Freddie Blay is a lawyer and he can take whatever case he wants to take. Lawyer for Aisha Wan in Krabia Ifadate tried to make an application for bail. But the judge said if he did, he would flatly refuse and that her mind had not changed because just a few weeks back, in Krabi Efadate made an application for bail and was denied. From the High Court Complex here in Accra, my name is Kweku Asante for Joy News. Now, Director of Legal for the National Democratic Congress, Abraham Amaliba, believes Freddie Blay's involvement in the case sent wrong signals and could weaken the fight against Galamse. Well, professionally, as a lawyer, there's nothing wrong with that because uh, as a lawyer, you are supposed to provide services, legal services to anybody who is seeking your, your, your services. However, on this matter of Galamse, considering the fact that the, that accusation and fingers pointing at government officials to be complicit in this uh, Galamse issue, if you have government lawyers already in Kabe, the fact that who is known to be connected to the MPP is uh, the one who is representing Aisha Wan. Now to have the immediate past chairman of the MPP also joining forces to defend uh, these Galamseyers, it gives the impression that, yes, government, um, as it were, is not interested in fighting the men. Uh, one would have expected that such lawyers who are from the NPC stock would allow their conscience to guide them and for them to desist from providing those services. Because it goes a long way to, as it were, point fingers at the government. Already there are some Ghanaians who feel that government is not doing enough to then have government officials doing this by providing services to such persons would go a long way to defeat the purpose of uh, the purpose that the president said he was out there to fight Galamse. So I think that they should have allowed their conscience to dictate to them that this is wrong for them to do. You think that Ghanaians cannot appreciate or, or delink the personalities involved from, from the case and, and the party? So if at the end of the day, it is found out Aisha Wan is to be discharged or acquitted and discharged, then people will be making their deductions and saying that the whole, the whole trial was what somebody would say, it was a fixed match, yes, it was a fixed match. How can your attorney general be prosecuting somebody in this matter of national interest? Then you have lawyers connected, and not just any lawyer. You have the former chairman of the MPP who sits in cabinet. Until now, he used to sit in cabinet. And I want to believe that cabinet abhors 
the Galamse uh, uh, taking place in this country. So, if you have the chairman who sat in parliament, uh, sat in the uh, cabinet, is openly defending a Galamsea, it gives the impression that clearly this, was, this is going to be a fixed match and nothing would happen to Aisha One. Mm. Let's go to Zoom now and speak to one of the voices that have been, uh, you know, quite vociferous and consistent on this campaign. Uh, Ken Ashibe is with the Media Coalition Against uh, Illegal Mining. Uh, Dr. Ken Ashibe joins us. Thank you very much, sir, for your time here on Joy News Prime. Let me start, first of all, with uh, what you make of how the case uh, has transpired so far, uh, has traveled so far in court. The third time Aisha Wang is being denied bail, and you heard the judge in court say, well, as reported by Kweku Asante, that she has made up her mind and that she will not grant Aisha Wang bail because uh, she does not believe that she will be available for trial if given the uh, opportunity to leave the custody. Well, I think that's, that's, that is very, uh, it's great news to hear uh, that you have a judge uh, that is looking at the case and have looked at this particular person who was deported but has come back into the country. Definitely, she's a flight risk. And so uh, this demonstration uh, uh, by the judge that she's actually going to look at the case, you know, on the basis of it and, uh, you know, has denied bail to them. It's gratifying, uh, really, really gratifying to note uh, that this is what is happening and the fact that uh, from all uh, intents and purposes, justice, at least from what we are seeing, is being served. And I'm also gratified by the fact that the media is straight, uh, training its eyes, eagle eyes on the case and ensuring that we are covering every aspect of it. And so that the judiciary, uh, the prosecutors, the investigators would know that we're paying attention to it. And I think it's also worthy of mention that you have the attorney general himself, you know, taking particular interest in this particular case. And he is going to court to ensure that the right things have been done. Mm -hmm. And not only is he going to court, but he's speaking to the media also as the case is going on. And I think this is the way to go to ensure that uh, justice is not only done, but justice is always seen to be done. And, and as you had him there, he's actually ready to start with prosecution uh, if the court gives the, uh, you know, the leeway to, for him to do so. Uh, but he was also today accompanied by the Minister for Land and Natural Resources, uh, who granted an interview as well to the media. Uh, now, when the issue of his deputy, uh, Mekuduka, George Mekuduka, came up, uh, he said, as far as he's concerned, he does not believe that George Mekuduka will uh, ever engage in illegal mining. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, given that we, have, uh, we are encouraging that persons with information on you know, illegal mining and the persons that are behind it uh, should actually come forward uh, with, with information? Yes, granted, George Duka has flatly denied, and on my platform yesterday he did so, uh, but what do you make of the response, the reaction of his boss, the minister? But I think the minister, we need to take everything he said in context. So there was a bit of it that he talked about his person, me personally not believing it. And I think it's, you know, it's something that we need to grant him. But in the same breath, he also made mention of the fact that, you know, it's not for him to decide, you know, and the, the investigations that should go on to be able to prove whether somebody was innocent or somebody was guilty. And it's important that we bring a contest of the person being innocent to proving guilty, uh, you know, is preserved. But the only way the person could be proven guilty or proven otherwise is if investigations should go on. Right. And I think there's that invita an invitation that has already been given to us by the president that, you know, if uh, such things are done, it will be investigated and would be looked into. So for me, I think it's in the interest of the Honorable Deputy Minister himself, you know, to submit himself to investigations and also to... Uh, the person who has also made the allegation to also provide the evidence and uh, to be able to back all of this. And I, I think we need to give uh, the minister the benefit of the doubt because in the same breath that he talked about the fact that he personally knowing the minister, the deputy minister, 
did not believe. He also mentioned the fact that, you know, it was not for him to be able to determine it. So I would hope that, you know, this thing will be investigated. And if truly the minister is innocent, it's established. If otherwise it's also found not to be so, uh, you know, uh, then uh, uh, prosecution uh, should take place. Right. Now, does it matter? Uh, or not, if Freddie Blay, the former national chairman of the NPP, takes over the case in defense of the four other accomplices of uh, Aisha Wang in this particular uh, issue? Does it matter at all? Well, I think that we need to situate that within the fact that every uh, suspect be, you know, this, the, uh, you know, the, um, is guaranteed some uh, uh, some representation so and it's for them to be able to choose who represents them i sitting back and looking if i were sitting in the shoes of the suspect i'm sure they had a strategy uh, choosing uh, you know the former um, uh, chairman of the mpp uh, who would have, have happened to also work with the attorney general before, and also we know the stature that he brings in there. Uh, you know, so in terms of the, the optics, the optics does not, you know, bode well, but we also need to realize the fact that, well, fortunately, he's now a former, uh, you know, chairperson of the party. Mm -hmm. He no know, he know more sits in parliament. So I would leave that and say that what is important is for, for the media to train their eyes on this particular case so that we ensure that no hunky-punky, you know, thing happens in court. And, but definitely his stature, you know, in terms of the perception game and even in terms of, you know, what would have something to do. And yeah. I'm sure it's the reason. If I were advising, uh, you know, the party so far as, you know, the whole PR thing were concerned, I would have asked uh, that if they could have, avoided this case as a deputy, uh, a former uh, chairman of the party. But, well, I think the, the MPP would make the point that he's a private person, he's made his decision in terms of which cases to take. We've been in this country and we've seen people from both sides, the NBC and the MPP, defend particular people. So they go, the, the, the lawyers go together, you know, yeah. to court yeah. to defend a particular person. So I, I would not read too much into this. The only thing is that we really can ensure that justice is being done is by the fourth estate of the realm to make sure that we're following this case as closely. And I, I trust Joy FM with the way, uh, multimedia, you know, uh, with the way you're following this. And the rest of the media are really following this case. I believe, I just have a good feeling uh, that this would go right. the way of, of this country. Mm. Uh, and I like the fact that the, the minister for Lance was in court as well. He's also a lawyer. Uh, providing all the support. And well. all of us should ensure that the same thing should be done. The and only and thing we are not relenting hope, at all. We are not relenting. But the only thing I would have hoped, if I can add that, is right. that the same way we're going with this particular case, in the situation of Akonta Mining Limited, where, you know, the minister has issued a press statement calling the the the, 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 uh, the uh, MPP uh, regional, Ashanti Regional Chairman's company, and who he is also CEO of it. I would have wished by this time the the, the, the IGP would have arrested him. Uh, investigations would have happened, and with the evidence that is available, he would also have been prosecuted the same way that this is going. And this is the thing that would ensure that everybody would realize that you know we are not playing with this issue of Galamse when our turbidity levels are about two thousand six hundred. This is not something to joke with. Dr. Ashid, I'm grateful that you could join us and you can join the conversation or the campaign with the hashtag no to Galamse. Meanwhile, the Ghana Water Company is, is warning that Ghanaians may be forced to pay more in order to get water in their homes because uh, illegal mining is disrupting the activities. Chief Executive Officer of the company, Dr. Clifford Barmer, says the operation cost of the company has now shot up tenfold as almost all River Body 7 as sources for treated water have been heavily polluted. He spoke to my colleague, Blazer Tsuga, on the polls. Yes. 80,000 Ghana cities. Yes, and that is the report that will go to the minister officially, but she had it herself. We're all there, when the operation staff, because the number of bags of uh, aluminum of That's more than tenfold. Yes. Yes. And this is where 
I will continue to ask that question. Now, when am I going to get the opportunity to put this cost to you to pay? I mean, who will not pay anyway? Why you know you that. <laughs> then the system will, that will you, you know Ghanaians will come at you when you say, well, let's pay more. Of, of course. Mm. And that is uh, where we have to be rethinking mm. of sustainability and assets. If you put cost as a major factor in the production and supply chain, mm. you might not be getting the level of efficiency that you expect. Why don't you give what the person requires and then you can demand that high level of efficiency from the person? You want the person to perform magic before you give him? I don't think... Uh, and and, and clearly in the, in, the, in the face of this, uh, the fact that um, it's gone up tenfold, we're setting, and, and I need to just uh, try and see into that crystal ball that by the next pricing window that the PURC will present before you, you're going to factor the activities of illegal mining into, into the cost build-up. We will do that. They might not give us full cost, but a lot of activities have changed, and all those parameters will have to be considered in reviewing the, the, the tariff. And so, as long as we continue to carry on some of these activities, when we were doing the tariff, yeah. uh, I, I we just the, uh, well, the sensitization, I, I used to tell people that, look, the cost build-up that makes the tariff are this. There are some that are self-inflicted. That we can eliminate. You can eliminate. Right. Ah, tell the people, stop doing the lamsay. Let the water level, let the quality of water get to the level Ghana Water Company will take. Then the cost will be taken out. Your tariff will come down. There are other ones that we cannot control. Then we maintain them. And then that's where we will ask the company. Pay. But if the one that you can control, the self-inflicted ones, you still want to keep it yourself. For me, as the managing director, the cost must be passed on. And the Ghana Water Company says it will not accept blame for the recent flooding in the Wager Bowie municipality of the Greater Accra region and its environs. Several homes were submerged, leaving over 1,000 people displaced after days of torrential rains in the area. Although the National Disaster Management Organization attributes the incident to the overflow of the Dainsu River, residents and some local authorities say the spillage of, by the Ghana Water Company at uh, the Wager Dam complicated the situation. When asked for their side of the story, Chief Executive of the company, Dr. Clifford Burma, uh, said the flooding was caused by encroachment on the buffer zones around the dam. We cannot, we cannot stop spilling. We cannot. And nobody can blame Ghana Water Company because when the dam was being built, normally to build a dam, you are looking at a river. So you are looking at your stream flow. Then because you want a pond of water to do one uh, project or the other, other hydro mm. or uh, waters to drink or irrigation, you put a wall across the river to create a poundment of the water. Mm. And the water is supposed to build some level because the, the wall does not have indefinite or infinite strength. Right. So you At don't have what infinite. level mm -hmm. of the water that the dam wall mm -hmm. Can retain. If you go beyond that level, the dam is going to collapse. It's like you have a wall standing there. The, the pressure or the weakness is here, but the water is building up. If it gets to a particular level, what it does is, is to push it across. So, so with a recent... Water, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole water mm -hmm. from the reservoir will find its way. So with the recent incident, the recent so that's, flooding. That's where I'm yeah, and so right. in building Wager, right. they created five outlets where water can spill if you realize the level going up. Five. And each of them can be open up to 21 feet. Are you getting me? Right. And so the maximum discharge from the, 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 the reservoir 
or from the spillway. Mm -hmm. 21 feet of five gates. And because of that, government acquired the zone, the buffer zone. So that if you open 21 feet and the five gates, it should not cause flooding. It will have its way and move into the sea. What happened? Ghana Water Company opened four gates at six feet. So this wasn't even the full complement that you opened? I'm saying, I'm telling right. you, four gates, mm -hmm. four out of five, that's 80%. Right. Now, away from the Ghana Water Company, the closure of shops in the vibrant business district of Kuma, Edum in Kumasi is beginning to bite hard as the protest enters day two. Hundreds of petty traders who rely on the retailers for their business say they are struggling to feed their families following a shortfall in their income because there are no goods to sell. Members of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, are calling on government to reduce taxes on imported goods, which is eroding their profits. The reason for the protest, Mona Lisa Frimpong has been engaging some of the traders in the following report. Loading boys sit idly at the central business district. On a regular day, they would be busy cutting goods in and out of shops. But that is not the case in the past two days. The industrial action of the Adum traders is adversely impacting their daily wages. <laughs> Right now, we are sitting here idle. Yeah, 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 I spent a lot on transport fare to come, but the shops are closed. What do you say? Headquarters in the central business district also share the same plight. So we want them to, to help us to reduce the, 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 the things because so that they can buy and we carry. Yesterday is not easy for us because yesterday, uh, even, even job money, Kura, yesterday I wasn't good. I wasn't good. Yesterday, Kura, seven cities, and I, I was good and, and I, I was go back to home. You are going to if you are going to buy or, uh, water, you are going to pay if you are going to buy food. Food, they are not they are not doing uh, two city unless you you add three city or five city. Truck drivers are among other frustrated groups with their inability to convey goods from the central business district to neighboring towns. Their vehicles are parked on the streets. Some are disappointed at the fuel consumed for their day's trip. I came all the way from Kintampo. I spent 1,000 CDs on fuel. I bought diesel on credit to fuel my vehicle here. I have slept here for two days, waiting for goods. There are ongoing meetings between the Ghana Revenue Authority and leaders of the various trade unions to resolve the issue of taxation. It, however, remains unclear if the action will be called off on Wednesday. For Joy News, Mona Lisa Frempon reporting. 
While the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Dr. Joseph Obin, says the situation in Kumasi reflects the high cost of doing business in Ghana, fueled by the CD depreciation as well as inflation. He insists the recent monetary policies introduced by the Bank of Ghana have only exacerbated the already harsh economic environment. It's sad that the consuming um, purchasing power of the consumer is so reduced to the barest minimum and that the ability to buy more is virtually nil. Yeah. And so it, um, the consumer is only able to buy just a limited few, meaning that it's curtailing on your turnover. Business thrives on turnover. Yeah. If your turnover is curtailed to this level, it means that your inability to service your loan at the bank. So this money that we're talking about, that it has gone up, it means that we are un even unable to service it. Mm. What is the bank going to do? Going to um, take over your property mm. or your limited assets. Yeah. So that's the picture, of the grooming picture of what is happening to us. Mm. The Bank of Ghana is not helping. As a matter of fact, they failed us. Because all these indicators are under the preview of Bank of Ghana. Okay. At some rate, they have to manage it. And they are not managing, man, managing it, even though we've given so many clues as to what to do. And maybe out of connivance or whatever, they are unable to do that. So uh, forest searching is not well managed. And then you keep on increasing the monetary policy rate. Forgetting that your inability to manage the uh, forest is what is um, 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 uh, inf uh, fueling the inflation. Let's speak to Professor Lord Mensah. He's an economist at the University of Ghana Business School, and he joins us on the line. Prof, this is beginning to bite hard uh, on traders, especially. Uh, we're seeing the city depreciate uh, and, of course, eroding their profit. Uh, they, they have called, among other things, for a pegging of the dollar, especially for Christmas. Otherwise, it won't be pleasant for you and I. Is that really something that can be done in the short term to address these issues, uh, you know, especially for traders? Yeah, I mean, it can be done. Um, the government, Bank of Ghana instituted a market called Forward Market. And uh, for me, for me, the volumes of trade on that market is too low. It's about time they grow the market. And looking at the seasonal pressures that we are facing mm -hmm. on the exchange rate as far as Christmas festivities are getting closer, I'm expecting that they will activate the market very well and ensure that, you know, um, traders can peg the dollar. Um, for three months, it won't be bad, you know, for the government to absorb, I mean, the possible premium that these traders are supposed to pay so that they can sell the dollar to them at a pegged rate, you know, going forward. And so it, it can be done because these are times that are tough. It's an economy that is import, uh, you know, dependent. So if these traders, you know, refuse to I mean, import, uh, we're going to have a big problem as far as this economy is concerned. So the government needs to, you know, in a way, I mean, take that drastic decision by cushioning the traders, uh, by, you know, in the, by absorbing some of this, you know, uh, premiums that they're supposed to pay in pegging the dollar. And we're sure it won't exacerbate our situation, which is already dire. Well, uh, yes, of course, it's a, it is an economy that is, I mean, I mean dependent on import. So... Uh, you have to weigh in between and get to know whether, you know, what you are capable to absorb as a country and then the possibility of shutting or grounding your economy completely. So I think uh, they may have to weigh in between the two. And I believe that uh, to a certain threshold, the government should be able to absorb this uh, premium. Thank you very much. That's Professor Lord Mensah. He's an economist at the University of Ghana Business School. You're watching Johnny Prime with me, Anas Mino. We're taking a break. When we return, we'll bring you statistics from the uh, Ghana Statistical Service on the increasing number of young people who are either married or living with men before the age of 19. Stay with us.
Thanks for staying with us here on Joy News Prime. The Ghana Export Promotions Authority, GEPA, is encouraging more young people to venture into agriculture and its related businesses as opportunities for exports of produce abound. According to Agnes Giftier J, uh, Sam, the director in charge of market promotion at the authority, they are helping young Ghanaians to take advantage of opportunities in the agriculture sector by giving them the necessary guidance in processing a great produce into finished product. She spoke exclusively to John News at the sidelines of a news conference on the seventh edition of the West Africa Agro Food Fair organized by Trade Fair. As I speak right now, we are in WA launching a youth in exports program. And um, this program is geared towards supporting the youth to enter into agriculture, enter into um, export businesses to uh, enable them also contribute to the economy in very, very productive ways. La we started this activity in 2020, 2021, where we supported about 20 young um, and graduates to enter into farming. We attached them to um, big farmers, they coached them, they mentored them, and after they graduated, we gave them one acre of land each, we gave them the necessary input. And a good thing is that this company already have off tickets. As soon as they produce, they have off tickets to collect their product. These youth are also being helped to process this product so that it will not be just exporting just raw materials. And so at the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, we value processing very well. So we are supporting the agri sector. That's why we call it the agribusiness, so that it's, it's not just a raw product, but um, we help them or enhance them in the processing so that it will command premium prices. Many people feel that Agric is something that is reserved for the aged. You see the data. Uh, how is Agric motivating now in terms of the data you see for young people to then venture into the sector? Thank you. I'm very happy you asked this question. This is because we have a number of new farmers and people who are doing things related to, with agric, who are young people. In fact, not just young people, but also young women graduates. They are doing various, you know, aspect of um, export from, I mean, agri businesses, especially the processed foods. We have a lot of young women who are processing and cereals. First of all, they are selling in top supermarkets in Ghana, and we are supporting them to export abroad. Recently, we had a program in um, Pennsylvania, and um, there were a number of agribusinesses, and all, most of them were young people. And um, we are helping these companies to put their products on big shelves in the U.S. And so agri agriculture is no more um, only preserved for the aged, but we have a lot of young people and interestingly, a lot of young women venturing into the sector. Now, 79,733, uh, that's the exact number of girls aged between 12 and 17 years in Ghana that are living or married to a man. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, nearly 26,000 of them are in junior high school and aged between 12 to 14 years. My colleague, Kofi J, data analyst with our research text, joins me in the studio uh, with some more detail, a breakdown of the figures. Uh, Kofi, mm. this is worrying. Well, you said it right. You know, 79,733 is the total number of girls aged 12 years to 17 who are either married or living with a man. And as we celebrate, you know, you know, Day of the Girl Child, we actually reflect on this number, which is very worrying uh, to have as a country. But if we do the breakdown, just like you said, we have 25,999, which is almost like 26,000 of these girls who are aged 12 years uh, to f uh, 14 who are in JHS. So look at this chart. So if you look at the total number of girls who are married or living with a man and are 17, are 12, or 7, 12 to 17 years, you have 32.6% of this you know, number uh, being you know, in GHS. So if you look at the bigger you know, universal set of you know, the 79,000, 
there's a subset of you know, young girls who are in JHS, and these girls are either married or living with a man, and I'm not sure uh, any mother watching us right now at home who has you know, a child with between, a, a girl child between uh, 12 to 14 years will be happy that this child should be given to a man uh, you know, to go into marriage at this young, very young age. But we also look at girls who, who engage in you know, economic activities. Um, you know, these girls that we are talking about, the 79,000, there's also a small subset, you know, a, a subset of them. If you look at this, 244,739, uh, uh, 731,000 are girls who have never, you know, stepped a foot in, in a school before. And this is quite worrying as a country to have this huge number of our future not, you know, having education as they are supposed uh, to have. But there's also more breakdown. If you look at, you know, three out of every 10 of these girls that we are talking about are in the northern region. So mm -hmm. let, let me show you this chart. I think this chart will tell the story proper. And so we go to the interactive map um, over here. So if you look at this uh, map area, this is, you know, map, the, the map of Ghana. And if you look at the northern region, you can actually see that this number that we are talking about is very prevalent in the northern region. And so of the 79,000 children that we are talking about, that they are either married or living with a man, you have 10.9% of them in the savannah region, you know, and also we have about 10.6% of them also living in the northern region. And, you know, the Northeast region having the biggest number, which is you know, 13%. Now, the national average is 4%. So to have 10 and um, 13 living you know, in the Northern region is extremely high. Extremely high. Kofi, thank you very much. And uh, non-governmental organization, World Vision, has been uh, involved in you know, issues of child protection, child rights, and they've done some work in, in this area. Barbara Megavi is a campaign coordinator with World Vision Ghana and joins us via Zoom. Uh, Barbara, the figures are staggering and very worrying, uh, but this is not surprising, especially in the northern part of the country. Uh, what are the emerging trends uh, that is making this difficult to tackle? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then um, I wish all girls a uh, happy International Day. So in Ghana, we have, um, Ghana is home to over 2 million child brides, including currently married girls along with women who were first married in childhood. So we, we, we know that they are um, quite, the, the figures that has been um, published is quite staggering. So one of the key, key contributors or drivers of child marriage is poverty. And then also we have teenage pregnancy, which is on the increase. So a lot of effort had been put in to end child marriage. But unfortunately, COVID rolled back a lot of efforts. With the closure of schools, most girls could not return to school. And then also there was an increase in teenage pregnancy. Mm. So um, interestingly, in the northern part of um, Ghana, child marriage is more formalized. So we get a lot of staggering figures. Whilst in the southern part, it is more of cohabitation, informal union. So in one of our meetings, we're even arguing whether it is, it's really, I mean, uh, whatever has happened prevailing in the northern is really real because it's more of an informal here. So like I said, so we have the poverty because parents, during COVID time, parents lost their jobs and they were willing to give out their girls. A girl leaving the home means one more mouth less to feed. Right. So poverty. And then lack of education. And then law enforcement of laws and policies on child marriage mm. and other child protection issues is mm. the drivers, I would say. But of recent times, the key is teenage pregnancy. Right. Well, we'll leave it here, Barbara. Thank you very much. And now we are seeing that COVID uh, has indeed affected every sector of the economy and indeed our social lives. You're watching Joy News Prime with me, Anna Smini. That's, uh, uh, you heard that Barbara McGavi with the uh, World Vision, the Child uh, Rights NGO. And that's it, uh, we're taking a break.